Scleroderma-associated interstitial lung disease is a tough condition, and the way it affects you can change. It's a fight, I get it, but you have to be as aware as you can be. And if you have scleroderma and start to notice symptoms like a dry cough or running out of breath while doing simple things, it might mean the disease has affected your lungs. This is called interstitial lung disease. My mom had scleroderma-associated ILD, so I know how tough scleroderma can be especially if the disease starts to affect different parts of your body, like your lungs. And if this sounds like you, you have to speak up right away. Talk to your doctors to get help. Hi, I'm Mary Wheatley, Chief Executive Officer of the Scleroderma Foundation. It's my pleasure to introduce our main stage speaker. First, I'd like to thank our sponsor for this session, Boringer Ingelheim. BI is committed to developing innovative therapies that extend people's lives and enhance their quality of life, and we're grateful for their partnership. Dr. Kristen Highland is our main stage speaker today, and she completed her undergraduate work in medical school at Indiana University before moving to Charleston, South Carolina, where she completed her residency in internal medicine. After serving in the United States Air Force, she returned to the Medical University of South Carolina and completed fellowships in pulmonary and critical care and rheumatology, as well as a master's of science and clinical research. Since 2013, Dr. Highland has been a member of the Cleveland Clinic faculty, where she serves as the research officer and associate program director for research and scholarly activity, as well as director of the Rheumatic Lung D Disease Research Program. Her clinical and research interests have focused on the pulmonary manifestations of rheumatic lung disease, particularly in people with scleroderma. We're so fortunate to have Dr. Highland with us today, and I, will, I know you'll find her research findings encouraging. Thank you, Dr. Highland. You are very welcome. And I am really honored to um, take part in the national meeting this year. Um, it's a true privilege to be able to speak directly to patients and their families. And scleroderma has been something that has been following me around since 1992. When I was in college, my best girlfriend convinced me to do a fundraiser called Trails to Sales. Um, for the Scleroderma Foundation. This um, was a 100 mile bike ride from Chicago to Michigan City and a boat ride back to Chicago. Um, and I rode the bike I bought with my paper out money in sixth grade. Um, needless to say, I've not, <laughs> I've not been on another trails to sales ride. One was, was quite enough, but then I have had three different neighbors in three different locations be touched by a family member with scleroderma. And then during my training at the Medical University of South Carolina, I met Dr. Silver, who is a international expert in scleroderma and scleroderma lung disease. And he was just the most wonderful mentor for me um, and provided me you know, a great start um, in my career that I now have at the Cleveland Clinic. But I couldn't do this without my patients. And I just have so enjoyed um, meeting these patients who are so positive and maintain hope and perseverance and are courageous and volunteer for clinical trials. And I just want to say a heartfelt thank you to all of them and to all of you. So today we're talking about how scleroderma affects the lung. And so we're going to mainly be focusing about on interstitial lung disease and pulmonary hypertension. Of course, patients with scleroderma can get pneumonia and they can get lung cancer and they can get asthma and they can get COPD, just like any other patient. But the two main manifestations that occur in the lung are interstitial lung disease and pulmonary hypertension. It's important to note 
that these can occur in any variant of scleroderma. So often we think of interstitial lung disease more commonly in patients with diffuse skin disease and pulmonary hypertension in patients with limited skin disease. But patients with limited skin disease can also have interstitial lung disease and patients with diffuse skin disease can also have pulmonary hypertension. Typically, interstitial lung disease occurs very early in the disease course when there is more inflammation and pulmonary hypertension occurs a little bit later in the disease course when there's more severe vascular changes. What makes things even more challenging is that sometimes interstitial lung disease and pulmonary hypertension can overlap. These pulmonary complications occur frequently enough that it is so important to advocate for yourselves by demanding that your provider screens you yearly for pulmonary involvement. Symptoms of something pulmonary going on may be shortness of breath or maybe decreased exercise tolerance. It's just a little harder to go up the stairs or maybe a little harder to carry your laundry basket around or getting the groceries in from the grocery store. A non-productive cough or a dry cough is very common. Sometimes there's chest pain or chest discomfort. Lightheadedness is an important symptom or fainting or near fainting. If you have those symptoms, that could mean that something's going on with your heart or lungs. Swelling in your legs or swelling in your abdomen. A fast heart rate or palpitations. These are all symptoms that could indicate that you have something going on in your lungs. If I could give you one piece of advice though, I would say to exercise daily because this can serve as a barometer of how your lungs are doing. Because the very first change in symptoms or the very earliest symptoms indicating early pulmonary involvement occurs with exertion. And that's because we have so much additional lung power and additional heart power to call on so that we can, you know, exercise, so that we can, you know, athletes can run the marathon. That if you are sitting on the couch and not moving, you could be getting sick and not even know it. But if you know, that you can walk around your neighborhood and it takes 20 minutes and it always takes 20 minutes and you always feel a certain way, you're probably pretty stable. However, if all of a sudden it takes 30 minutes or 35 minutes and you're not, you're cutting off a block or you're having to sit down for a little while, that deserves a discussion with your provider. Now, of course, it could be that you have arthritis or muscle pain or weakness or something else is going on, but a stable exercise capacity is reassuring when it comes to heart and lung involvement. In addition, exercise is good for your soul, um, good for your emotions, and is allows you to stay better conditioned, which extends your ability to be independent. So the first part of my talk is gonna be on interstitial lung disease. So interstitial lung disease is an umbrella term. The lay person may say pulmonary fibrosis or scarring in the lungs or inflammation in the interstitium of the lung. 
And what I tell my patients is that you have your airways and you have your air sacs and that you have your blood vessels. And the stuff that kind of holds everything together is the interstitium. And here you can see a healthy lung where the interstitium, which is the pink, is very thin between the red blood vessel and the alveolus or the air sac. And in the scarred lung, you can see how that has become thickened. And that makes it harder for oxygen to get into the bloodstream and carbon dioxide to get out. So how common is interstitial lung disease? Well, if we were to do an autopsy, almost everybody with scleroderma has a little bit of scarring in their lungs. About 25% of patients with scleroderma may have some abnormality on their pulmonary function tests. Depending on the type of CAT scan, this may be as high as 84%. And the interstitial lung disease is more common, 50% in diffuse patients versus 25% in limited patients. And fortunately, interstitial lung disease causing chronic respiratory failure occurs in just over 10%. Here is another way of, of looking at the prevalence of interstitial lung disease, and you can see that the green represents diffuse patients and the blue represents limited cutaneous scleroderma patients. So at 180 months, which is, you know, about 15 years, you can see that about 50% of patients with diffuse cutaneous scleroderma versus 24% with limited cutaneous scleroderma have pulmonary fibrosis. So how do you check for this? The first important test is the pulmonary function test, or people may call these PFTs. And you will um, go um, to see a respiratory therapist. They will put a clip on your nose and they will ask you to blow as hard as you can through a tube. And this is not as easy as it looks. And for those of you that have smaller mouths, it can even be challenging to form a seal around the mouthpiece. But with time, you'll be able to do it. And what we're looking for is something called restriction, where the lungs are smaller than they're supposed to be. So the numbers that we look at as providers, we look at the forced vital capacity or the total lung capacity, and these measure how big your lungs are. We also look at a measure called the diffusion capacity or the diffusion capacity for carbon monoxide and we call that DLCO. And that represents how well oxygen gets into your bloodstream and carbon dioxide gets out. It represents gas exchange. However, very early in disease, pulmonary function testing can be normal. Here is data from a clinical trial called FOCUSED in patients with very early scleroderma. These patients had their scleroderma for less than two years. And if you look at the forced vital capacity, that's the second yellow line, it is above 80% in the patients that were studied. That's normal. Anything above 80% is normal. And the DLCO is in the mid 70s. And 
with for diffusion above 70 percent is normal so the pulmonary function testing in this group of patients would be called normal and if you look at the bottom line of these scleroderma patients you'll see that 65 percent of those patients in that study had some evidence of interstitial lung disease on CT scan. This is a CT scan. It's a donut. You lay on a table that will slide through that donut. You'll be asked to take a deep breath and hold it. And you will see pictures of your lungs that slices you like a loaf of bread. And this is what a normal chest CT looks like. The heart is in the middle. The spine you can see at the bottom of the picture. And the lungs are basically black or, or dark gray. The white lines are blood vessels in the lungs. And what we're looking for is evidence of interstitial lung disease. And this CT in the bottom uh, is a patient with scleroderma and interstitial lung disease. Um, this CAT scan is a little bit higher up. So in the middle is the top of the aorta. But if you look at the lungs on both sides, you can see extra white markings. These are highlighted by the black arrow. And the radiologist may say words like reticulation or septal thickening. Sometimes you might hear honeycombing. You might hear traction bronchiectasis, which means that the airway is kind of distorted by the fibrosis. Or you may see ground glass opacity, which is kind of a hazy haziness to the CT scan. Or the radiologist might say, this looks like NSIP, which is nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, or usual interstitial pneumonia. So I encourage you to become familiar with the vocabulary of interstitial lung disease, so that when you are communicating with your provider or reviewing your records, you can see these code words that indicate the potential for having interstitial lung disease so that you can advocate for yourself. We are able to stage patients with interstitial lung disease by looking at how much interstitial lung disease is present on your CT scan. We then combine that with your pulmonary function. So if you have less than 20% involvement by scarring or inflammation, you have limited extent of interstitial lung disease. If it's greater than 20%, that's excessive disease. And this matters as we think about which patients need to be treated and which patients could potentially be observed. If we're not sure, it's somewhere between 10 and 30%, we then look at the pulmonary function and we look at that forced spinal capacity number. If that is above 70%, you stay in the limited disease bucket. If it's less than 70%, that is extensive disease. Fortunately, we do not need to do lung biopsies in patients with scleroderma. But if you were to have a lung biopsy, the pathology that we see is that of nonspecific interstitial pneumonia. And this is a, a, a picture of a biopsy, and you can just see, see just kind of the diffuse pink um, on the slide, as well as a lot of, a lot of dots, which are um, lymphocytes or inflammatory cells. The other pathology that sometimes we see in scleroderma is UIP, which stands for usual interstitial pneumonia. Now, one of the reasons it is so important to get screened 
for interstitial lung disease right away is that it's early in scleroderma when you're inflamed when you, is when you have the greatest risk of decline in your pulmonary function testing, decline in your forced vital capacity. And here you can see that the greatest decline was in patients who had only had their scleroderma for two years. Um, and it's less and less the farther out patients go. And that's also why many of the clinical trials in interstitial lung disease and scleroderma are designed to catch patients early. Now, if you look at all the patients with scleroderma, generally um, NSIP has a fairly reasonable prognosis with only a very slow rate of decline in the forced vital capacity over years. And this is much better than some of our other lung diseases. However, there are some patients that have a more severe drop in their forced vital capacity. Um, and these are patients that we want to identify quickly so that we can intervene. So risk factors for progression may include African-American race, male sex. There are some genetics involved. Patients with diffuse scleroderma have a little bit worse course than patients with limited. Your provider may look at your nail folds under a microscope, and if there's abnormality, sometimes that's associated with worse interstitial lung disease. Or if you have prominent vascular abnormalities like digital ulcers or pulmonary hypertension. The antibody that is most commonly associated with scleroderma interstitial lung disease is anti-topoisomerase 1. The other word for that antibody is SCL70. But there are a variety of other antibodies um, that your provider may be checking that can also be associated with worse interstitial lung disease. So there is consensus by experts in scleroderma and scleroderma interstitial lung disease that all patients with scleroderma should be screened for interstitial lung disease. Your provider should be listening to your lungs, listening for something called crackles, you know, rice, like uh, Rice Krispies snap crackle pop, or it sounds like Velcro with a stethoscope. You should be getting pulmonary function testing, including the diffusion capacity, and an HRCT. And of course, we need to know about your respiratory symptoms. And then you need to be monitored. You need to be monitored carefully, particularly if you have new scleroderma. So who should we treat? Well, generally we treat patients with extensive interstitial lung disease, or if we have any evidence of disease progression, such as your forced vital capacity, has dropped by 10%, or your diffusion capacity has dropped by 15%. Or if you have limited extensive disease, but you have risk factors for progression, such as an African-American male with a positive SCL70, for instance, these are patients that we would elect to treat even with mild interstitial lung disease. And so then when we think about how we treat our patients, we think about pathogenesis or kind of how we get there to interstitial lung disease. And like most diseases that we have, there's generally some trigger on a permissive genetic background that causes molecular abnormalities. And so early studies have focused on inflammation and antibodies, B cells and T cells to explore potential therapies. And so the first little bit of success occurred with the scleroderma lung study number one, which studied oral cyclophosphamide. Cyclophosphamide is 
sort of a pretty strong drug that is used in, in chemotherapy, but also by rheumatology. And what that showed, and you can see this in the, the white boxes, so the top left um, quadrant, more patients who were getting cyclophosphamide had a modest 0 to 5% improvement in their forced vital capacity than placebo. And if you look at the bottom right quadrant, more patients on placebo had a drop in the forced vital capacity. It was modest by, you know, less than 5%. However, because cyclophosphamide is a strong drug with side effects, it's a type of chemotherapy, you can't be on cyclophosphamide indefinitely. It's too dangerous. And so these patients got a year of therapy, and then they were followed for a second year off of therapy. And what we see at 24 months is that the treatment effect is pretty much gone. So that led the scleroderma investigators to propose scleroderma lung study number two. And that studied mycophenolate, which is also called Celsept or myfortic, versus cyclophosphamide, because at this point it was felt to be unethical to ever use placebo again. And so patients were randomized to getting cyclophosphamide versus mycophenolate for the first year. And then for the second year, they stayed on mycophenolate if they were on mycophenolate or switched to placebo if they were on cyclophosphamide. And what this study showed was that there was really no difference in patients in either arm. So the cyclophosphamide arm and the mycophenolate arm had a modest improvement in the forced vital capacity. Similarly, the both arms showed a decrease in the modified rotten skin score, which measures how thick your skin is. So these drugs were considered equivalent, but the patients on mycophenolate had less side effects, less toxicity. So then the newest kid on the block is tocilizumab. That's also called Ectemra. And this is a drug that has FDA approval for other rheumatologic conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. And so patients in this study were recruited if they had very, very early scleroderma, if they had diffuse skin disease and very active skin disease, and if they had markers of inflammation, like a high CRP or sedimentation rate, which are blood levels showing inflammation, or a high platelet count. And so this was a study looking at whether skin got better or not. Patients were randomized to tocilizumab or placebo, and they were followed for 48 weeks. And this is um, the same study of the patients that I showed you that had normal pulmonary function testing, but 65% had evidence of interstitial lung disease on their CT scan. And unfortunately, it did not seem to have a, a benefit in skin disease. But what was really interesting is that it seemed to have a significant benefit in the lung. And if you can look at all patients, the left-hand graph, knowing that 35% of those didn't even have lung involvement, versus patients that had evidence of interstitial lung disease on their CT scan, which is on the right, you can see that the patients on tocilizumab had stabilization of their forced vital capacity, whereas patients randomized to placebo had significant decline within that first 48 weeks of their lung function. In fact, in patients with scleroderma, 
and interstitial lung disease, over 25% of that cohort had a drop in their forced vital capacity by 10%, which is clinically significant. So you can see a significant um, improvement in forced vital capacity percent decline in patients randomized to, to tocilizumab. So based on these data, tocilizumab became the second drug ever FDA approved for scleroderma associated interstitial lung disease. Now, there has been some interest in specifically targeting B cells, which is a type of lymphocyte that makes autoantibodies. And rituximab is a drug that targets B cells. It's also FDA approved for rheumatoid arthritis and other rheumatologic conditions. And you can see in the pathology slides that patients with um, scleroderma and interstitial lung disease, you can see that in panel A, have increased B cells on biopsies of their lung. And so in this tiny little study, eight patients got rituxan, six patients basically got placebo, and there was seem to be some improvement in the patients getting rituximab in forced vital capacity and diffusion compared to control. And bigger studies investigating this are ongoing. There was a, a look at the USTAR registry um, that looked at 254 scleroderma patients that got rituximab, so this is um, looking at a registry, not a controlled clinical trial. 181 of those patients had interstitial lung disease. Other patients may have been getting rituximab for their skin disease or for arthritis or other indications. And there seemed to be a benefit in skin disease, but we didn't see um, a significant change in forced vital capacity. Nevertheless, there seems to be a trend in scleroderma experts using rituximab sort of for, for um, rescue therapy. Now, another way to really suppress the immune system is to just replace it with autologous stem cell transplant. And this is where your um, immune system, <laughs> sorry, we just had thunder, um, immune system is stimulated and your stem cells are removed, and then you are given chemotherapy, you might get some radiation, and then you get your stem cells back. It's like sort of like getting a blood transfusion. And then you have to wait 10 to 20 days for your bone marrow to start working again. And that has shown some benefit in scleroderma. I'd like to mention that this is very, very different from the clinics that are recommending, you know, withdrawing blood and these abdominal injections. These are, these are hoaxes. Our professional societies recommend against these. The FDA is investigating these. This is a waste of your money and potentially dangerous. So autologous stem cell transplants are done by hematology doctors in special centers of excellence. And this is based on two trials, the ASTIS trial and the SCOT trial, which showed that patients getting stem cell transplant had better event-free survival long-term. But if you can look at both of these graphs, HSCT is the transplant versus control, there is early on, this is when you're waiting for, you know, the bone marrow to kick back in, there is worse outcomes, but then with time, there's better outcomes. And here you can see 
that in these two studies, the majority of patients did have interstitial lung disease and did have some improvement in the pulmonary function testing. And so because of that, the European League Against Rheumatism has made some recommendations regarding this, that it should be considered for treatment of selected patients with rapidly progressive scleroderma as risk for organ failure. But in view of the high risk of treatment related side effects and of early treatment related mortality, Careful selection of scleroderma patients for this kind of treatment and the experience of the medical team are of key importance. Well, what about looking at some of our other pathways? The fibrotic pathway in scleroderma has um, been highlighted over the last several years. Um, and the first um, study was the census study, which is the largest scleroderma study, 580 patients worldwide study ever performed um, with a focus on scleroderma associated interstitial lung disease. And this led to the first drug that was FDA approved for scleroderma associated interstitial lung disease, which is Nintendinib or OFEV. And in this study, patients were randomized to Nintendinib or placebo Patients were allowed to be on background mycophenolate or methotrexate. Very few patients were on methotrexate, but about 50% of patients were on nintendidem. And what the study showed was that there was a 44% relative reduction in rate of forced vital capacity decline in those patients getting nintendidem. And this is another way of looking at the data. And you can see these curves separate at about 12 weeks and maintain separation. And we now have data over 100 weeks that shows that continued separation uh, with patients, the dark blue line, intended to having a much um, shallower rate of forced vital capacity decline than those on placebo. And if you look at patients, um, whether they were on mycophenolate or not, patients um, on both mycophenolate and intended of the solid blue line did numerically better than those only on intended of, which is the dotted blue line, versus only on mycophenolate, which is the red line, versus on neither, which is the dotted red line. Unfortunately, this study also showed no change in the modified Ronin skin score. There is a second antifibrotic that is available. Um, this one is perfenidone, and this is the um, topic of scleroderma lung study number three. And these results um, should be forthcoming, hopefully, by the next meeting. So in general, for scleroderma interstitial lung disease, it's important to also think about comorbidities. Reflux. If you're having severe reflux and you're microaspirating into your lungs, you can be further worsening your interstitial lung disease. So reflux needs to be treated aggressively. Patients with interstitial lung disease, as I said earlier, can also have pulmonary hypertension. Certainly depression doesn't work, doesn't help things and should be treated. Patients may need oxygen. I already talked about exercise. Pulmonary rehabilitation can be very, very helpful and improve quality of life. Nobody should smoke. Avoid exacerbating triggers. Please get your vaccinations. This includes flu. This includes pneumonia, and of course, COVID-19 vaccine is so important. You may need to talk about what your goals of care are with your provider. How can you get help with some of your troublesome symptoms like your cough or shortness of breath? Are you a candidate for lung transplant? You can see here in this graph that scleroderma interstitial lung disease patients can do as well as patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis after transplant, which is another type of interstitial lung disease. And of course, 
are there clinical trials that you can participate in? And we are so grateful when you do participate because that helps us move the needle um, in this disease. So I'd like to now shift to pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension means high blood pressure in your lungs. This is, causes a strain on the right side of your heart. And in the top graph, you can see kind of normal blood flow, normal alveoli. However, if there is scarring in the lungs, or there's clots in the blood vessels, or the blood vessel is thick and narrowed, or the left side of the heart is not working as well and the veins are congested or the alveoli are damaged, this can all cause pulmonary hypertension. And it's not a stretch of the imagination to understand the reason that patients with scleroderma get pulmonary hypertension, because this is a very vascular disease. Patients have changes in their fingers, they have gray nose, they have telangiectasias. Here you can see a picture of a pulmonary arterial where you can see it's thickened and it's narrowed. Um, this, is, this is the pulmonary arterial. You can see a little bit of a blood clot right in the middle right there. We call that in situ thrombosis. And so the risk of getting some kind of pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary arterial hypertension in scleroderma is somewhere around 10% um, based on a variety of different registries. And the risk factors for this include limited cutaneous scleroderma, although we still need to look for it in diffuse patients. Generally, patients with longer disease duration, you know, eight to 10 years after Raynaud's has been there, extensive telangiectasias, abnormal capillary microscopy. Here you can see what normal capillaries look like under the microscope. And in panel B, you can see that there's capillaries that are dilated. There's some areas where there's no capillaries. This is abnormal. It makes us worry about lung disease, both interstitial lung disease and pulmonary hypertension. If you have an ANA, which is generally positive in scleroderma, that has a nucleolar pattern under the microscope, that can be associated with pulmonary arterial hypertension as well as the anti-centromere antibody. Remember topoisomerase or SCL70 is ILD, anti-centromere is associated with the pulmonary hypertension. One of the blood tests we use to screen for pulmonary hypertension is nt pro -BNP or some labs just use BNP. If these are elevated, it's more likely um, to have pulmonary arterial hypertension. Or if you look at the FVC to the DLCO ratio, so if the diffusion, diffusion capacity is down out of proportion to the force vital capacity, that ratio is greater than 1.8, or the diffusion is less than 60% predicted, that would be a risk factor for pulmonary hypertension. Because the prevalence of pulmonary hypertension is high enough, you know, estimated to be around 10%, there are actually screening recommendations for scleroderma by the World Symposium on Pulmonary Hypertension that anyone with a diffusion less than 80% should be evaluated annually using either the DETECT algorithm, which is a two-step algorithm that tells you whether you should get an echo, and based on the echo results, whether you should get a right heart cath, versus just getting an annual echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart, versus looking at that FVC to diffusion ratio combined with the NT pro BNP. And if any of those are abnormal, patients need a right-sided heart catheterization. These recommendations go on to say, maybe just all patients should get an annual echocardiogram. And here you can see a graph in patients who were screened prospectively versus just came to medical attention. That's the red line. 
and patients who are screened, detected, and treated early, and much favorable survival curve compared to patients who presented when the cat was out of the bag. Now, pulmonary hypertension is kind of complicated in scleroderma because it can be due to multiple causes. Patients can have thickening and narrowing of their pulmonary arterial. These are the size of a strand of hair, and you stretch them all out, they cover an entire tennis court. But if your pulmonary arterioles are thickened and narrowed, that builds up resistance. And that's called pulmonary arterial hypertension or group one pulmonary hypertension. It is a very special type of group one pulmonary hypertension that patients with scleroderma sometimes have called pulmonary venoocclusive disease. Where patients look just like pulmonary arterial hypertension patients, but they also have pulmonary vein involvement in addition to pulmonary arterial involvement. And this can be very, very tricky to treat. Patients with scleroderma can have heart involvement. And if the left side of your heart is not working, that can cause increased fluid in your lungs. I call it like a traffic jam. And that's group two pulmonary hypertension, which is very, very different than group one and does not respond to the same therapies. Group four pulmonary hypertension is chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. This is when you have blood clots in your lungs clogging up those pulmonary arteries, causing like a traffic jam. And this is potentially surgically correctable. So it's important to look for whether you might have a chronic blood clot in your lungs. That's group four. And back to group three, interstitial lung disease. If you have scarring in your lungs, maybe you have less blood vessels and not a whole tennis court. Or you may have low oxygen, which causes your blood vessels to squeeze. That can cause group three pulmonary hypertension. And so it is quite the evaluation to figure all this out. We will do a detailed history. We'll get a chest x-ray. We'll get an EKG. We'll do that screening echo. There's a test called a VQ scan, which looks for blood clots. We'll do the breathing test to see if you have evidence of interstitial lung disease. We'll do some blood work. We will ask you to walk for six minutes. And before we can tell you that you have pulmonary hypertension, we have to get a right side of the heart catheterization. So here's a patient with a chest X-ray. Now the chest X-ray is not particularly sensitive. So early, early in your disease, it might be normal. But if you hear words like large central pulmonary arteries, which you can see with the white arrow, these are really large or peripheral pruning, where we don't see very many blood vessels in the edge of the lung, or an enlarged right side of the heart right here is very large. You don't have this dark space right here. Um, those are code words for pulmonary hypertension and more involvement needs to occur. Likewise, an EKG can be perfectly normal with early disease. But if you hear words like right atrial dilatation, or sorry, right axis deviation or right atrial enlargement or right atrial dilatation or right ventricular hypertrophy or right ventricular strain, that suggests pulmonary hypertension and deserves further workup. The echocardiogram, which is the ultrasound of your heart, is our best screen for pulmonary hypertension. And you're looking for a right ventricular systolic pressure to be less than 35. When, you, when it's 35 or greater, that suggests pulmonary hypertension. But it's so important to look for other signs of pulmonary hypertension on echo. And this is abnormalities in the right-sided morphology or function. So you're going to look for enlargement of the right ventricle, are a small left ventricle, or they might say the left ventricle is D-shaped, or there is flattening of the septum between the ventricles, or the right ventricle is hypokinetic, which means it is not moving very well, or there's septal bowing, the, the, the septum which divides the right and left ventricle is moving towards the left. There's a measurement called TAPSI if that goes down. 
that suggests right ventricular dysfunction, or if the right atrium is dilated. Other clues could be a pericardial effusion or an enlarged pulmonary artery or mid-systolic notching. So those are code words for the possibility of pulmonary hypertension. So it's not just the pressure, but what is the cardiologist telling you about the right and left sides of the heart? Nevertheless, the gold standard for making the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension is a right-sided heart catheterization. In this procedure, generally it's the cardiologist will put an IV in your jugular vein in your neck or may go through your arm. Through that IV, they'll thread a wire that can measure pressures in your heart and out into your lungs. And it can measure the right atrial pressure and the pulmonary artery pressure and something called the wedge pressure, which measures the left-sided pressure and the cardiac output. And there are other variables that we may um, calculate, including the cardiac index and the pulmonary vascular resistance. We can look for things like holes in your heart and whether any medicines that you inhale may improve your hemodynamics. And so the definition of pulmonary hypertension requires that you get a right heart catheterization. The definition is a mean pulmonary pressure greater than 20. That's all those different types of pulmonary hypertension. For group one pulmonary arterial hypertension, you have to have a mean pulmonary pressure greater than 20, a pulmonary vascular resistance greater than three wedge units, a pulmonary wedge pressure less than 15, meaning that the left side of your heart is normal, and a cardiac output that is normal or reduced, and no evidence of things like blood clots or interstitial lung disease. Now, the one of the ways we follow your pulmonary hypertension is by doing a six minute walk. My patients sometimes call this their six mile walk. Um, and it's important to know that sometimes this is a difficult for patients with scleroderma because non-pulmonary aspects may blunt your walk, like hip pain, for instance, or ankle arthritis or muscle weakness. Nevertheless, it's not necessarily improvement in, in, in your walk that is so critical, but it's, is your walk declining? And so here you can see um, that a patient whose walk is improving really has no difference in survival, but a patient whose walk is declining has a, um, a decreased survival curve. So we want to see um, that your exercise tolerance is stable. Another thing that we're gonna do is we are going to try to determine what your functionality is. And so we call this the functional classification or WHO functional classification. So if you're class one, you have no symptoms. If you're class two, you might be able to do everything you like to do, but you might have a little bit of discomfort um, doing those things. Class three, you're slowing down. Class four, you're really unable to perform any physical activity without signs or symptoms of um, right ventricular failure or shortness of breath or feeling like you're going to faint. And so with all these data, we determine your risk. And what we want is for you to be in this green column, this low risk column. So we don't wanna see any evidence on exam like swollen legs um, that would indicate right heart failure. We want your symptoms to be stable. We do not want you to be fainting. We want your function class to be very good, a one or a two. We'd like to see you walking greater than 440 meters. We'd like that NT pro BNP to be normal as well as your right atrium and no pericardial fusion. And we'd like your hemodynamics to not be too bad where your cardiac index is preserved at greater than or equal to 2.5 and you have a normal right atrial pressure. So we are looking for all of these things. And so your provider may be using this as a risk assessment tool, or there's another one called Reveal, 
or uses is a calculator that we can get online that uses some of these evaluate some of some of the um, um, some of the data that you saw on the last slide plus um, hospitalizations pulmonary function testing um, some demographic data um, and the reveal risk calculator. So either of those are really important because what we want is to intervene to keep you in that low risk data. And what that requires is frequent therapy every um, three to six months being seen by your doctor and getting a new echo and getting labs um, and, and occasionally getting repeat right heart catheterizations, particularly after changes of therapy or clinical worsening. So the therapies that we have available for pulmonary hypertension target three big pathways. We have the endothelial pathway. Endothelium is a potent vasoconstrictor. We have the nitric oxide pathway. Nitric oxide is a potent vasodilator. And we have the prostacycline pathway, which is also a potent vasodilator. These drugs also um, have effects not only on dilatation and constriction, but as well as proliferation and platelet function. And so we have three drugs that block endothelium, they're endothelium receptor antagonists. We have ambrosentin, bocentin, and masitentin, and these are all pills. We have two, we actually have three drugs that target the nitric oxide pathway. Two of them are called phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors. One is sildenafil, the other is tadalafil. These are oral drugs. The other drug is a soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator, Rio Sequat. That's also oral. And then we have a variety of ways of targeting the prostacycline pathway. We have a prostacycline receptor agonist, which is selexapeg, as well as prostacycline analogs, including epoprostenol, iloprost, and triprostenol. Triprostenol is unique in that it can be given orally. You can inhale it. It can be intravenous or subcutaneous. Epoprostenol, which was our very first drug for pulmonary arterial hypertension available in 1996, is just intravenous. And typically we make decisions based on a treatment algorithm like this. In general, if you're in a high risk strata, we're probably going to give you IV medications. If you're in a low risk strata, we're probably going to give you a combination of oral medications. We're going to follow you very, very carefully every three to six months. And we may add a third drug um, to get you at goal. We may even consider you for referral for lung transplant. Um, but we're going to continue to assess and adjust medications to get you into that low risk strata. And then finally, the last um, exciting news for um, patients with scleroderma comes from the increased study design um, for inhaled troposinol for PHILD. Remember that this is approved for pulmonary arterial hypertension, which is group one, and it was looked at in group three, pulmonary hypertension interstitial lung disease, where patients were randomized to inhaled troposinol versus placebo. And about 25% of the patients had underlying connective tissue disease. The majority of these were scleroderma. And what this showed is that patients randomized to placebo had a significant improvement in six minute walk distance of 31 meters, which is statistically and clinically significant in addition, they had a reduction by 40% in their NT-PRO BNP, which is one of those key variables in the risk assessment um, tool. And there was some surprising um, data 
um, pulmonary function testing were obtained um, for safety. And patients on terpostinol compared to placebo had a modest improvement in their forced vital capacity as opposed to a decline in those randomized to placebo. So now there's a question about whether um, targeting endothelial cells or the vascular pathway um, could be a benefit in interstitial lung disease as well. So with that, I'd like to conclude um, with the, the pathobiology of scleroderma lung disease, both interstitial lung disease and pulmonary hypertension involves the interplay of disordered fibrotic, immunologic, and vascular pathways. Yearly screening for pulmonary hypertension and interstitial lung disease is recommended. All subtypes of pulmonary hypertension may occur in scleroderma and may even coexist. Pulmonary arterial hypertension is associated with a lower diffusion and a higher force vital capacity to diffusion ratio. There is increasing evidence for the role of immunosuppressive therapy in scleroderma associated interstitial lung disease. There is added benefit of the addition of antifibrotic therapy as seen in the census study. Inhaled troposinol appears to improve outcomes in patients with scleroderma interstitial lung disease and WHO group three pulmonary hypertension ILD. And just a reminder, pulmonary arterial hypertension is defined by a mean pulmonary artery pressure greater than 20 with a wedge less than or equal to 15 and a PBR greater than three wedge units. An early proactive treatment is recommended using combination therapy when appropriate. And finally, the goal of pH therapy is to achieve that low risk status. And I will leave you with this last slide that together, you pulmonologists, rheumatologists, cardiologists, we can look forward to increasingly brighter days to come in scleroderma lung disease. And I will be happy to field any questions during the question and answer period. Thank you.